What's good, my people? Welcome into No Catch Up Sports Talk via Chicago. I am your host, Sean Little. Big Nick the Quick with me as always. NBA is off and running, and we have yet to touch on it here at No Catch Up. We're going to talk about the NBA, our first thoughts about a week plus in. The Cavs look unbelievable. OKC, tougher than we thought. A lot to talk about. Paolo goes down with an oblique. That kind of kills the magic little run they had to start the season. But a lot to talk about in the NBA. Is the three-point jumper killing the momentum, the spiciness that was the NBA and the reason we loved it? John Morant at the cup. More stuff like that, less threes. Is that is that better for the NBA? We'll talk about that. Then uh, the NFL, of course. We'll recap that. Is Mahomes the MVP? Forget about the numbers. Is this a spot where you just throw the numbers away and he's the MVP because of what he does additionally on third and fourth down, just whatever is necessary? We'll talk about that. I, I'm going to let Nick talk about the Bears. I don't really want to talk about the Bears, to be honest with you. I, I don't know what else I could say about the Chicago Bears that I haven't said over the last six to seven years of doing this podcast, but I'm sure it'll come up, and I'm sure we'll chat about it and, and talk about a couple of different things. But around the NFL recap, tons to talk about. No catch up. Sports Talk in Chicago. Let's get to it. Now look at my Really? Oh, so that's how you're going to play it. you going to do this? Okay, fine. That's all I needed. That's all I needed for him to do that. And it, it became personal with me. Big Nick the Quick, what's happening? Man, how we feeling? You already know. Back back New York. I'm in the middle of the, the constant travel. I got yeah. Montreal coming up. Then me and you are actually in L.A. for a wedding. Our boy Will, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, I just got back from the Breeders' Cup last week. Cool event. Too, a little too fancy. Like, are you not? Are you not there yet? I'm not there yet. I guess like, a, a little, a little too fancy. It seems like one of those you got to be there. You got to be there, be there type of events for sure. Cool to, cool to experience. The shout out my guy Tim Doyle, who I do uh, the Turner stuff with. He hooked me up with a ticket, and it was like a once in a lifetime thing. It was the Trophy Lounge. I got a crazy picture. My fit, I love how my fit came out. The suit looked really good, but it was just like a little too stuffy, you know? A little yeah, too yeah. many bullshit conversations. Yep. And I'm not, I wasn't there, you know, looking for rounds of funding for my for my business. So I didn't. You didn't, you, didn't bring need, your, you didn't bring your pitch deck? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I wasn't asking anybody for a hundred million. So I was, I felt like I was a little out of place, but it was cool to. Oh, so is it one know. of those type of events? Is it a, is it a big business type situation? A lot of yeah, have, it's a lot of VC money up in there. And clearly, you know, work the room, do that yeah. type of thing. And yep. yeah, it, it was, it's just a high level, high class sure. event. We met some cool people. I met a dude uh, whose dad was the police, police chief in new Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, he was sitting at Avery Johnson's table. Shout out Avery Johnson. So we got to connect down in New Orleans. But like, you know, stuff like that. It was it was just very high level, cool people to meet, but felt a little out of place. It was funny. It's like, I'm clearly like a plus one in an invite, right? I'm a, a small time yeah. media guy. And then there's like all these rich people at the top. And then there's like influencers, so, like, guys that are just, like, popular and they can bring some positive light to the event. So, yeah, interesting sure. crowd, but it was fun. And we hit some bets. Shout there out. Doyle put some bets together. I hit a straight bet on the number eight. My only rule of horse racing, because my dad's favorite number was eight, is if it's anything 10, 10 to 1 or less, I just bet the eight to win. That's my only strategy when it comes to horse racing. We hit Mage in the Kentucky Derby a couple of years ago, my birthday. He was eight, so it's a, it's a fun thing to do. But, yeah, fun weekend. I'm go. looking forward to kicking it with you in L.A. in a couple of weeks, too. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, but let's get to the – yeah, no doubt. Let's. I still haven't booked my hotel, by the way. I got to get on There you that. go. I'm fucking around. Be, Sean's going to be pay- – you're going to be looking about 980 at night. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not, did you I'm book not your, doing did you book this. Your, did you book your flight? My flight is sorted. My, uh, my hotel is not sorted. So oh, my know, God. Sort the hotel, that. brother. Yeah, I gotta get hey, bro, bro, seven bro. days out. Bro, get the hotel sorted. Bro. Last time so, yeah, I, I checked, gotta... they were like eight hundred a night. So yeah, you probably want to knock yeah, that no, out no, for no, you. I gotta, I'll make, make a couple. Uh, paying twelve. Make a couple calls. Six. Yeah, make. Some calls. <laughs> make, make talk to who you need to talk calls. to. Who you need to talk to. Get that sorted for sure. Yeah, I'll hit you after this. Actually, about that, we'll get that talking about. But yeah. 
Let's talk about the NBA, man. Early takeaways. Let's start with one of the hot, hot beat topics that I, uh, a couple of the big media people have touched on. Uh, I thought Nick Wright uh, off of FS1 made a really good point about essentially you need to evolve. Boxing thought they would always be the most popular sport in the United States. They're no longer that. Baseball thought that's America's pastime. It's always going to be the most popular sport. It's no longer that. The NBA is dealing with a little bit of an issue here for the regular season where there's so many games, the the superstar element of them potentially not playing in some matchups with like the thing with Joel Embiid and throughout the years with Kawhi. And uh, even if it's actual injuries they're dealing with, it's about the perception, right? The perception is they play when they want to. And I think a lot of people b- believe that it cheapens the regular season. And now we have a situation where there's almost no highlight real plays because casts are just playing three point line to three point line, getting easy rebounds off the off the rim, kicking it to a dude, and then knocking down a three. Now, for me, for the the for us, I should say, for the real NBA fan that enjoys basketball, you can still find the beauty in this three point style game, the rotations, the switches, the how they're getting open looks, all that stuff is enjoyable, but. The ratings are dipping. We talked about that the other day, Nick the Quick. Does the NBA have a three-point problem or a product problem here, especially during the regular season? Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit last night, and I think uh, yesterday when I was talking to you about it, but I did pull the numbers. Opening uh, opening night doubleheader from ESPN compared to last year was down 42% in overall viewership, which is a staggering number if you think about it. I think last year they opened with uh, Victor Wimbayama. This year it was Bucks Sixers. Obviously, Bucks Sixers, the Thunder was taken away from it right away with no Paul George, no Kawhi. Made me not want to watch the game, but I'm being completely honest, and I'm an NBA head, right? Like, I look forward to opening night. You add that to it, the fact that the NBA does have this weird situation where the league is extremely popular, right? Like, NBA players are extremely popular. You look at social media. You look at the conversation around things. You even look at when transactions happen in the NBA, Woj bombs, different things like that. Like, you get a ton of reaction, right? So by all measurables, the NBA is extremely popular, except for the one that pays the bills, which is people watching the game. (laughs) Which matters a bit, right? Especially when you're talking about TV deals and all these things. It's partly yeah, an man, indictment it, on society as well. Like, they want hot button, hot plate things. Yeah. And it's not even about what happens on the floor. But, yes. Yeah, exactly. 100%. It's about the lifestyle. It's about the culture. It's about yes. the news, the drama. Like, the NBA is is the best drama in all of sports. Well, we've um, always really said that. It, but we've always said that, right? But people just aren't watching the games. I think it's interesting that you talk about the highlight real play. Just last night, you had those two back-to-back John Morant 360s. I have seen those on TV, like John Morant dunk from half court. Like it was the greatest highlight ever. Hey, they were great. It was awesome to see the 360 layup. Shout out, Ja. You know, he's making a great comeback. But I think that that really slams your point home and that when something like that happens, like that is the highlight of the night. Whereas you go back 20 years ago, you probably saw a lot of that. So I don't know if it's all the three-point thing. I think it's a combination of, yes, the game to a lot of people isn't as exciting with all the three-point shooting. When you look at the three-point shooting in the NBA, the only players whose threes are really exciting to watch is Steph Curry, right? Like, Steph Curry three-pointers are essentially like a slam dunk. Everybody else are just guys shooting threes. So it does make the game a little bit boring, especially if you're not locked into, like what you said, the rotations, the ball movement, the fact that you got centers running point guard and different things right now that can be really exciting to someone who's more of a diehard basketball fan. But I think to the casual fan, you turn on a game and what was it, Boston the other night, I mean, shoots piece, right? And it's just like, this isn't as exciting as what I used to watch, right? Then you take away the big men, right? We used to always like watching the big men, not necessarily slow back to the Bastic post-up play. But when we were kids, the game was dominated by big men. You had Olajuwon, you had Robinson, you had Shaq. These were these larger than life personalities that you did want to tune in and watch. I don't know if they necessarily have that anymore, even though, again, the game's players are extremely popular. Then you add in the fact that on some of your marquee teams, we'll use Philly as the best example, their two biggest players just haven't played yet this year. 
right? We are seven games into the season, and the Philadelphia 76ers have had no Joel Embiid, no Paul yeah. George. So you're not yeah, going to – he played last night. They Paul George played, made his Paul, debut Paul last Paul night. Paul George yeah. made his debut last night, but you're talking about a team that's going to be on national TV every five or six games that they play, right? So, team, people aren't tuning in to watch that if you're not watching the Stars. Um, because, again, the product on the field, on the court, isn't as compelling as it used to be to some people. So I don't know if they have a three-point problem as much as they do have an overall product problem. And they really need to figure out why people aren't tuning into the games. Because there have been some great games. I think another thing that they have with the NBA is, and it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, I've been thinking about this a lot, is that old guard, right? What should be the old guard of the NBA is just refusing to go away, Right. Not just LeBron, but you go down to KD, you go to Dame Lillard, you go to just name it, right? All these guys are still here, and they're still kind of dominating the headlines. And what I think it's doing is it's not allowing us to appreciate the younger up-and-coming teams that we really should be paying attention to, right? We should be watching Cleveland. We should be talking about Oklahoma City. We should be talking about, you know, whatever San Antonio Orlando. has going on. Orlando, yeah. right? Orlando gets no pub. I, mean, I know Ben Carroll's out, which is going to be a big setback for them as far as getting people to watch. But still, you should be talking about things like this. But because these guys won't go away, and we spend entire summers trying to figure out where Kevin Durant's going to play basketball next, or if he's going to get into a fight with Stephen A. Smith, it doesn't allow you to elevate some of these younger guys the way that you should have, right? Like, this should be the tail, or we should be in, like, the Giannis era right now, right? Like, we're kind of at that end of the Giannis era, and now that's those next guys. We're still in the LeBron, KD, all these other guys era, and I think that that also hurts it, too. Um, And just the fact that you're not really giving that new product to folks, right? Like, look at the NFL. It's like, hey, what are we talking about? Oh, man, this great young generation of quarterbacks. You're CJ Stroud. You're Lamar Jackson's. All these guys, right? You got Brady and all these other guys out the way. So now you're almost selling us a new product. The NBA is selling us the same storylines for the past 10 years with the same players involved, right? And I think that there's some fatigue around that. Like, I don't want to follow James Harden sagas anymore. I don't want to see where Paul George is signing in free agency. I want to talk about some of the young guys. I want to know about SGA. I want to know about Chet. I want to know about Wimby. I want to know about Bancaro. So I think it's so you think it's a marketing thing. That. I think yeah. I think it's a lot of things that those guys just won't go away, and and they shouldn't. They're still very impactful uh, players. Yeah. Kevin Durant was on fire the other night, um, but see, I disagree with you there because I think LeBron and, and Durant. Guy, right? Yeah, but I yeah, but I still think <laughs> Durant and LeBron are still very interesting. Right, so I, you I do, think, you do, yeah. you that could do. Be it. I mean, they're still at the top. Yeah, okay. You that, just said, "Hey, Nick Wright said that we need to evolve. We're not evolving if we're still following LeBron James twenty-five years later, Kevin Durant." Damn, so we're the later. old guard, huh, Nick? We are the old guard. We're the old guard now, G. Like <laughs> Ant Edwards should be, Ant Edwards should be the face of the league. And I know they're they're trying, right? But like that should I be think the he's face pretty of the close, league. Though. He he's is, but, to be in the face but of the still, league. it's like. Again, we spent a half a day yesterday talking about KD and KD versus Stephen A. Smith and stuff yeah. like that. It's like these guys are kind of like not going away. And I'm not and the answer isn't that they should, because they're huh. still very, very, very good basketball players that are extremely impactful. But it's like as long as they're just looming, um, I think it it, it kind of it kind of blocks some of the shine of uh, the other more exciting things that are going on in the league. I mean we, we, I know we want to talk. Uh, we want to talk Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City is like an eighteen point point differential right now. Like they are absolutely yeah. smacking folks. But let me give you let me give you a number yeah. on, on how much the game has changed. And the, I was doing I was digging up some numbers because my best bet on the line six thirty p.m. Eastern. Check it out on True TV. Was Luca? I thought Luca would have a big game against the Pacers. It's a good matchup for him to just exploit what they do and how they play. So we were looking at numbers. Last year, the Dallas Mavericks were number four in three-point attempts per game at 38. Now shooting 37 again. That's 14th in the NBA. They were number four shooting 38 per game last year. They're now shooting 37 a game, and that's 14th in the NBA. Boston is shooting 50 threes a game. Charlotte's shooting 44, right? So even just last year, it's showing how much it's even leaning more into the three-point jumper. This is where it is for me, Nick. 
There's no meaning in these early games in the regular season. That's why superstars aren't pressed to play. That's why franchises aren't pressed to get superstars in the lineup. Nick, it is the first week of the NBA season. Half the team, half the conference makes the playoffs. And there's 70 games left. So unless you're a, well, because what is business, any business about? It's about retaining customers and adding new ones. Hoop heads like us, they know are going to watch anytime, any place, wherever. But how do you attract new customers when the product you are selling them is essentially meaningless basketball throughout the regular season, especially early on? And then on top of that, when the, the new dude and the new casual that says, hey, let me give the NBA a shot, is turning on the game, and Charlotte and Boston looks like the same game I literally could watch at LA Fitness. They're just a lot more skilled, right? So new people coming in to watch the NBA aren't going to appreciate the nuances. I think a perfect example is Americans saying soccer is boring when they're first getting into it. It's 1-0. It's 2-0. A game can end 0-0. How do you like this? But the beauty in soccer is all the smaller things, cross passes, touches. And you and I figured this out years ago, but you're starting to come on to the soccer things. It's about crosses, ball placement, set pieces. Not about once you, Yeah, once you start appreciating all that other stuff, the game gets so much more interesting. But you have to... Dig in and start watching that. But, it's tough. But, it's go ahead. I was gonna say that's a. I think soccer is a great point, and using my journey in soccer it, it, it is really a great example because yeah, I, I've been watching now for four years. I'm still trying to figure out the game, like defending in soccer. I, I couldn't explain defense in soccer, right? Like it's still I'm still kind of coming around. But what they have going for it is you get into the whole. 360 degrees of the sport supporting your club and you know buying the merchandise and doing that whole thing and it it, it does bring you into the games but that doesn't happen in the NBA right like you are into every other thing around the NBA and the whole culture and all that but it still doesn't get you to tuning into the games and I get your point that hey look they're not as compelling in the beginning of the year and I think from a rating standpoint we can't discount the fact that look we had a Yankees Dodgers World Series that is rare, and people are going to tune in. I watched all of the ALCS, NLCS, and the World Series, which never happens for me usually, but I was drawn into it. You add in the fact that you have an NFL season that's very compelling going on right now, but still people aren't tuning in. I think you got a good point to where if you're a casual or someone who's trying to get into it and you were to put on one of these games, even if it's a TNT or an ESPN or an NBA TV game that are supposed to be your marquee matchups, you are going to sit there and be like, yeah, this looks like something I'm watching at the YMCA, which isn't the case when you put on a soccer match or, or obviously a football game, right? You can't really get that anywhere else. And I don't really know how they fix that. Like you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube with the three point shooting because everyone realized, wow, this is the way that we should have been playing a long time ago. Um, well, also too, like we add the play in, the play in is awesome. It's been once great. We, once we get, get to the play-in. We got to get there. Prior to that, I mean, there are teams 10 games below 500 getting in the play-in. Yeah. So, and like it or not, the reason why college football was so controversial and a little more interesting was because week in, week out, you had to win or you probably weren't going to have a shot at the you national title, right? Yeah. So, like, this is going to be the first year of this 12-team playoff. One verse two doesn't have the buzz like it did previously. That's just naturally going to happen when you allow when less is at stake. Less is at stake for the. This is the lowest stake the NBA regular season has ever been. Period. Yes, there's more talent. Yes, there's uh, the most skilled lot of players and most fun teams throughout the league to watch. But there's less at stake. Human beings are compelled by pressure and stakes and that stuff just isn't there when we're talking about uh the early 15 games in to an nba season the reason i believe the premier league and soccer also is compelling is because 
There is no playoffs. Yeah. You can't drop points. Yeah. You either, if you start dropping points, the game two and game 15 can all come back and bite you the same way because you need points to keep climbing and staying on top of the table, right? So yep. that's also another reason why soccer is compelling. So are there too many games? We've, we've known that. Yeah. So like Nick, because we, we've we've known eighty two is way too many games. That's one thing. I'll, that is for sure the case. You brought up the play in, right? And we could talk about the NBA Cup. One thing I'll, I'll always give Silver credit for is he is constantly trying to find the new thing. He's constantly trying to tinker with things. They're always trying to introduce things. When they introduced the play in, a lot of people thought it was stupid. Remember, LeBron was like, "This is stupid. Why are we doing this?" And then now you know it really does make that last two weeks of the season very compelling because you have teams that would normally be in full tankathon that are trying to get into that play-in game a la the Chicago Bulls, which is where they usually find themselves. You add in this NBA Cup, there's a reason that they do it at the beginning of the year, right? There's a reason they start, they do it in that first half of the season because they also know our first 41 games aren't compelling, right? Like, it's some teams who are going to rise to the top. It's other teams figuring out, do we suck or not? And then once they do figure out they suck, they spend the second half of the season trading everybody away and figuring out what they're going to do for next year. But in the lead up to that, yeah, it's not really exciting, right? We all know, especially we all know Boston is going to have the best record in the NBA, certainly in the East. We know that Oklahoma City is most likely going to have the best record in the West. Like a lot of that is kind of already a foregone conclusion. So what do you do if you're silver, right? You can't give up games because games are revenue. So do you now expand this NBA Cup and take more regular season games and make them cup games? Is that the way to do it, just to add some sort of intrigue, to add some sort of competition? To your point, Americans, we thrive off competition. We thrive on things of being, you know, having some sort of stakes attached to them. Is that what you do, right? Hey, maybe now we'll take 20 regular season games, add some weight to them, add a different type of cup format, maybe have it play for something else. I'm not too sure, but they do need to figure it out. I think you hit it right on the head. The games, it's not necessary. I was wrong. It's not the product. It's the it's the implications. Yeah, there are none. There are none this early on the season. And then you add Nick, to the fact again that we have other things going on right now. Folks aren't. As there's popular. zero. There's zero. There's zero implications right now in the NBA for the most part because, as I mentioned, three quarters of the league is getting into potentially the playoffs with the play in included, and then there's NBA going on. There's all. T- I mean NFL going on. There's a lot of different things going on. So I, I think the NBA – go ahead. I was going to say, I also think they have a big problem going into next year because there are a lot of people who watch on Tuesdays and Thursdays to watch TNT crew, right? Like the games could suck, but you want, I always go back and rewatch inside the NBA. I'll always turn in a halftime to see what those guys are talking about. Like I think that the the, the, the implications beyond – just getting like I think that it's deeper moving those guys off the NBA like I really think that there will be a tangible impact to that because they are so synonymous with the NBA product right getting back to product and to pull them away from it like you do have people that tune in just to see what's going on on the TNT broadcast so I think that's another thing I think that it was kind of short-sighted to move it over to NBC or whoever it's going to be which is going to be another very buttoned up broadcast similar to how ESPN's is like there was something compelling about having a sports league that had that type of pre, half, and post um, show attached to it. And I think that's why you invited those guys to do college, because you want to try to bring some of that over during the tournament. So I think stuff like that, like I will say that that move to me was short-sighted. If I was the NBA, I was doing everything possible to keep it on TNT. And again, I don't know the back work, because I'm sure you have more, more knowledge into how that all went down. But like, that shit matters. Yeah, thoughts on – okay, so, yeah. They, I mean, we just talked about how the pop, the players are more popular than ever. The storylines are most popular than ever. It's just I can't get someone to watch the second quarter of Charlotte Pacers at 9 o'clock. That's like, that's the tough part, right? So, let me ask you this before we move on because this has actually been a really good conversation. I've, I've, uh, I've enjoyed this. Tell me your thoughts on the three-point line. Do they move it? Do they change it at all? Do they – what, what do they do with that? Or they just keep it how it is and, and we figure out a, a, another route. Yeah, I would just I would just keep it uh, keep it how it is. I don't think moving it back is going to do too much. These guys are pulling up from – I forget who I watched the other night that literally pulled up from the logo. 
Um, and it, and it was, I think it might've been Cam Thomas. Have, against you, the Bulls. have you heard the, yeah. the, the, the Cam Thomas with track? Yeah. 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 Cam Thomas unconscious. Unconscious. <laughs> Cam hey, Thomas with track. Marshall Henderson level green light. <laughs> so, Shout yeah. out Marshall Henderson. Man. Shout out Marshall Henderson for real. <laughs> a couple, a, <laughs> a couple of people were talking about smoothing it out. So there's no corner three. It runs. I mean, they're. Then you're changing, it, you're fundamentally changing, you're changing basketball. I mean, you put a well, lot of I people out of work the point, if there's right? no corner three. You put well, a lot of <laughs> Bruce, Bruce Bowen. Bruce Bowen wouldn't. We wouldn't know Bruce Bowen if there was no corner three. Yeah, you said. Oh, you said. Oh, gee. Yeah, you sent him straight yeah, OG, to the gym. Yeah, OG and Anobi's like, no, nah, hold on, bro. Yeah. This is how I eat. No corner three. Yeah, That's no my corner family. three. You talking what about? You, what do you? What do you want me to do? What, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I got to live in Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's interesting. I. It's a very fine line because. You could go throughout the history of time with any with anything. There was people that when the three point line came in came into play, like this is stupid. I hate this. So like anytime there's there's uh, an evolution in sport or in business, you're always going to get pushback. Kodak didn't want to flip to the digital camera; they wanted to stay on film. Kodak's bankrupt. So like the the there's always a different you know evolution that is going to push back, but maybe in the long, the long term, it's, it, it'd be good for hoops, but let's talk about hoops overall and what's going on right now, because the rules are the rules right now. The games are the games right now. And the product has been good. I've been watching. Nick has been watching. The Cavs look unbelievable. Unreal. Kenny Atkinson and has unlocked what they want to do offensively. They look a lot more loose. They're not as focused. They just look like a, a, a more polished continue. The, the, the continuity they've been showing on offense and defense has been amazing. What are your thoughts on the Cavs? I think the one big thing is there was questions swirling all last year about Donovan Mitchell. Is he going to be around? What are they going to do with Donovan Mitchell? Is this when you move Donovan? Should the Cavs punt and get Donovan out of there? Donovan doesn't want to be there. This, that, and the third. Donovan Mitchell looks fully locked in. Darius Garland hasn't been dealing with injuries like he was last year. He looks locked in. Then the two bigs are the two bigs in Mobley and Allen. And then Sam Merrill is strapping up boys on defense. They look very, very good. The bench is solidified with my guy, uh, Karis LeVert, coming off. He will get them up. Give me your thoughts on the Cavs overall and what they got going on to start the year. Last undefeated team left in the East. Yeah, I mean, everybody was uh, everybody was saying Donovan Mitchell was gone, was a foregone conclusion, right? Oh, you got to get him out of there. Him and Garland can't play together. They also have the Al and Mobley problem, da 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 and, and instead of listening to what everybody was saying, right, they re-signed Donovan Mitchell immediately, right? No, no yep. drama over the summer. Just maxed yep. out Donovan Mitchell, rolled it back, understood, hey, Mobley's going to get better. Garland and Mitchell, this is now year three. They're going to figure they out. Maxed how to out play they maxed out everybody. They maxed Mobley out everybody. Got paid. Mitchell said, got paid. We got, we got young players that are good. They added Struess in the, in the last offseason, too. Struess is still, yeah, still there. And they, and they brought in a better coach. Look, Kenny Atkinson was a great coach in Brooklyn until Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving showed up. If you remember those, those Donovan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what's my man's over on the, on the Lakers now? D Lo. D'Angelo. Oh, uh, yeah, D'Angelo Russell. Yeah, D'Angelo Russell, D'Angelo Russell, and those boys like he had D'Angelo. Yeah, they were Russell they were an they were dancing dancing and shit on the by the bench. Yeah, yeah that was yeah yeah he, yeah he had them as an he had he had D'Angelo Russell as an all star. He had that team as a playoff team, and then once Durant and Kyrie got in there, they decided they didn't like him. But Kenny Atkinson's been a good coach, so you bring, you upgrade the bigger staff to Atkinson, you bring back the continuity which you just talked about. Sometimes you got to if you have guys that are good. Jared Allen is good. Evan Mobley's good. Darius Garland's good. Donovan Mitchell's great, right? When you have those type of guys, it's in your best interest to try and figure it out. Try to figure it out, and that's what they're doing this year. They're undefeated. They're absolutely smacking teams right now, and they look like a legitimate contender out of the Eastern Conference, and guess what they're not trying to do? Figure things out. We're not trying to figure out how to fit this guy here and that guy here and this guy here and that guy here. It's year three or four with this same roster. These guys are learning and growing together. That's another year older for Mobley, who's a young player. It's another year older for Garland, who's a young player. Garland is 24. Evan Mobley is 23, right? Like, these are young players. Even Jared Allen, who's been in the league for a while, is only 26. 
So these are young players who are figuring it out. I still think you run into an issue in the playoffs playing Allen and Mobley together, but guess what? Cross that bridge when you get there, right? You have all year to figure it out. We just talked about how the beginning of the season is kind of inconsequential. So if you're Kenny Atkinson, figure it out. What's the best way to maximize having Allen and Mobley on the floor? Now, obviously, if Mobley continues to develop and he's able to push his shot a little bit outside so that he can create a little bit more spacing, you can find a way to play him and Allen. So if you're Atkinson, that's the challenge right there. But guess what? You have a bona fide number one guy that can win you games. I watched them the other night. Was It uh, It wasn't against the Knicks. I forget who the Cavs were playing when Mitchell just went off in the fourth quarter, right? Pulled up from the logo, ended the game. Like, you have guys. So I, I'm happy with what I'm seeing in Cleveland, man. I did not want them to break that up. I really did. I thought that that was a good situation for all parties involved. You just had to figure it out. No, no doubt. And yeah, Max Strews dealing with the injury. He'll be back. I think it's an ankle. He'll yeah. be back here pretty soon. But they got a Karis solidified LeVert. five. They got a solidified five. Karis LeVert is bringing buckets off the bench. Ty Jerome is bringing buckets off the bench. Dean Wade is bringing buckets off the bench. Niang is bringing buckets off the bench. Strews is going to be back. They got a nice little squad. Hey, Nick. You know how close I am to the Knicks at the moment. They had three bench points last night against yeah, the they can't. They can't score. Nick, they, they have three they, bench points. Yeah, they can't score. Their team is not deep at all, which really concerns me going, going deep into a season. I would, be, I would be sounding some alarm bells if I'm a New York Knicks fan right now. I, it, I, don't, I don't know how deep we can caress this subject. But <laughs> I, I 100% would be worried because they cannot score. Like they can't score. They're the well. This the, the thing always about things that bench. Well, when you're starting five, is very good. Just like the Knicks starting five is very good, and when they're clicking on all cylinders, it's very good. But when they're not clicking on all cylinders, it's through through the history of the NBA in basketball. Is if you could get some guys that can come off the bench. Vinny Johnson's nickname was the microwave yep. because when they when when. Detroit needed, he would come out and he was instant. And they get to play against second units, which aren't as good as first units, right? They had three points off the bench and they were Tyler Kolick, a rookie. Deuce McBride was over from the floor. They only played eight players. So you got to have guys coming off the bench that can, that can impact. If you look at Boston, they got, what's his name is, is going to be top three in voting for the sixth man of the year, my man from Oregon, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Not Pritchard. Pritchard? Pritchard. Peyton Pritchard. Yeah, Pr- has Pritchard, been abs- Pritchard. Yeah. Has been cooking off the bench. So the you got to be deep. The bigs thing is interesting, though, for Mobley and Allen because we have seen that. But a big reason why the Knicks beat those boys up was because the Knicks had a ton of edge. They had bigs that were physical, and they played with an edge that Cleveland couldn't match. Yeah. A lot of those guys aren't on that team anymore for the Knicks. So it, it's, and it's say what you want to, to about Cal. Cat isn't necessarily an edge guy. Extremely talented, can absolutely fill it up. What do you have? Forty four the other night. Like he can absolutely fill it up. But to your point, yeah, you lose a little bit of that edge, and then you know when you start making trades and losing bench guys like a Hardenstein and different players like that. And remember, Hardenstein was absolutely massive for them in the second half of the season and going into the playoffs last year. And you let guys like that walk, what starts happening is all these other guys who maybe were eighth, ninth, tenth men are looking up in their seventh or sixth men, right? And that's a whole different role. I know we're going to yes. talk about Denver. That's what Denver is going through. I like Christian Brown. He yoked on Gobert the other day. But Christian Brown is now playing 35 minutes a night. It's a little bit different than when you have Brown playing 20 to 25 to now when yeah. you're relying on him to be a starter, play heavy minutes and have an impact every single night like it changes things. That's what's been so fascinating about Boston's roster construction is they have continually been able to add bench guys and role players to this whole thing, right? Like, yeah, the top half of their roster is incredible, but you get down to the Pritchards of the world and, you know, even Hauser last year was playing minutes. Yeah, Luke Cornett, who they somehow, his 10 minutes a game are valuable to them. Xavier Tillman, Tillman, Hauser. These, Hauser, these guys, it all matters, right? And when we go back to Denver, I know we're, maybe we'll just transition into Denver right now, 
when you go back to when they won the finals, who were they getting big minutes from? Brown off the bench, Christian. Brown off the bench, Bruce. You know what I mean? Different bench guys that were coming in. They were Shout getting out Bruce Reggie, Brown. Reg, yeah, they were getting Reggie Jackson minutes. You know what I mean? Like you were getting minutes from guys all over the place. So one through nine was extremely solid. You go to that Knicks team last year, you were getting Deuce McBride minutes that were valuable. You were getting Isaiah Hardenstein minutes that were valuable. And when these guys start going away, it's hard to replace that, right? Like you can't win with just your top two guys, especially in a Tom Thibodeau coach team because he is going to tax those guys, especially his scores. Jalen Brunson is going to get taxed every single night. You can go back to Nate Robinson. You give I've been saying this for years. You give Tom Thibodeau a little guard that can lead the show and score, that's all he needs because he's only interested in coaching defense. So he is going to tax those guys, so you need to get them help. That's why losing a guy like DiVincenzo, DiVincenzo is an ultimate role player. Hey, you need me to come out and give you 25 tonight? I'll give you 25 tonight. You need me to come out and hit a couple big threes tonight? I'll do that. You need me to come in and fill in the blanks? I'll do that. You lose a guy like that, and it changes things. Oh, yeah, I think the Knicks are in trouble in the sense of they, they 100% need a microwave off the bench. They need Emmanuel quickly is who they need, right? Because, again, Tibbs needs to be able to put in these little guys that can carry them for stretches of offense, and they don't really have that right now. I mean, 97 points last night against Houston, that ain't going to cut it. You said four four bench points? That's Three. insane. Three, Three bench, bench points. points? They that only scored insane. 97 points. Yeah, yeah so. and, and you got to find that guy. No, no doubt. It's uh, the bench. You need, it's a full, you need a full squad when we're talking about competing for, for titles. We'll see how, how it starts to shake for the Knicks throughout as they, they go through these growing pains of the new squad that they have. Now, let's talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. Ooh, ugly. They're one in six. Yeah, it's a bad Coming chance. into the year, Nick, it was – well, last year, Dame Lillard arrives. He's dealing with a divorce. Off the court's pretty noisy. He's still trying to figure out the pick and roll situation with Giannis. We talked about that ad nauseum. Giannis was not interested in running the pick and roll a ton with Dame Lillard because <laughs> yeah, so. I'm Giannis and I don't want to do that. Basically, is yeah. I don't want to do that as much as you guys want me to, or as much as it would be beneficial. I just don't want to do that. They get the coach fired. They go and get Doc. So they're in the middle of the year. Doc is putting together his philosophies, all that noise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Coming in. What are, what, are, what are Doc's philosophies? Listen, coming in, they got a whole offseason. We'll be able to, you know, incorporate things. But we also talked about this ad nauseum. The roster is ancient. They got a bunch of old guys running around on the floor. The Middleton, roster was ancient two years ago. The roster was ancient two years ago. Chris Middleton has double ankle surgery. Who knows when he comes back? And when he's back healthy, he's not – a uh, consistent killer anyway. We've been waiting for him to come back for two and a half years. So he came back last year. He helped him. Now he's out again. And he, and he just got maxed out, by the way. So where are we at on the Milwaukee Bucks? Nick, they're one and six. Their only win is against the Sixers, who had no Embiid, no, no PG. PG. Maxie, yeah. the, at, Maxie had to shoot it 35 times. Where are we we're, at we're, on Milwaukee is – We've been to give everyone a peek into our group text. Me, Nick, and my guy, and our guy Ben had an argument about Giannis almost a year and a half ago about where how the timeline was going to work out. And I tried to tell these boys he was going to start, they were going to start to struggle in Milwaukee. He was going to force his way out. And this was when the Knicks had a bunch of picks. I was like, he's going to be on the New York Knicks. I don't know where that stands now. It's probably dust because there's not a lot of assets for uh, the Knicks to move around anymore. But Talk to me about where you're at with the Bucks, Doc Rivers, Milwaukee, how they're playing, the roster, and what do they do? Does, is Giannis going to pack it up? We've been talking about that for a while now, too. What is the disgruntled call coming, Nick? Is the yeah. tweet coming? Giannis is disgruntled if, well, in Milwaukee. If I'm So first off, the, the Bucks are exactly where I thought they were going to be going into this year. One I've six? been saying this. Yes, I've been saying this for the better part of two years, right? Three years, that what they're doing to Giannis in this prime that you're getting out of Giannis, which is look at the numbers, 
Look at how he plays. It's an absolute prime. Giannis is a fucking monster, right? It's not a news to anybody, but again, if you haven't been paying attention, he has been a monster. He was a monster last year. He was doing everything possible to win ball games last year, but you've done nothing to upgrade this roster around him. Yeah, you brought in Dame last year, which was a good move, right? We've been saying forever, get somebody to play with Giannis. I thought that they should have went after Mitchell or any or Harden or any of these other guys over the last few years. You never heard Milwaukee involved in any trade talks whenever a big superstar was looking to move, which to me was always crazy because you have a legitimate Hall of Fame top three guy and you're not doing everything you can to put the right talent around them. Add that to the fact that your best players who were already old, Middleton was already 30 when he won the championship. Lopez was already an older guy when he won the championship. Guess what? It's three years later. Those guys are that much older, right? Middleton has been perpetually hurt over the last two seasons. You're always waiting for him to come back. I never like the guys who don't start the season healthy. And now this is back-to-back years that Middleton has not started the season healthy. You've lost role players in DiVincenzo, Grayson Allen, different guys that were on your team. We talk about, you know, six through 10 and getting through the regular season with those guys. You don't have that anymore. And you've done absolutely nothing by way of drafting young, impactful players, right? And you can do that late in rounds. Golden State was able to find Padre Marinsky, whatever the guy's name is. Uh, yeah, we'll about the Nuggets. Yeah, Pajemski. The Nuggets were able to find Brown. You know, good teams have been able to draft players in that 20 through 30. You just got to hit on those players. Who has Milwaukee brought in? Name one of their young draft picks that has hit over the last three or four years. They have nobody in there right? Even Boston, Hauser, these guys are late, late, late draft picks that you're finding a way that their 15 to 20 minutes that they're giving you are impactful. Milwaukee has none of that. So if you're Giannis, you're looking around this roster, are you saying, oh, is Chris Middleton coming back going to help this? No, right? Nothing that you have (laughs) around you right now is going to make this situation any better. You have issues scoring, you have issues defending, and you have Doc Rivers at the helm who, look, Doc is a great front runner, but... (laughs) Tell me about your favorite time that Doc Rivers has improved a bad ball club. That's not what he does. So you're probably going to fire him, giving you your third coach in the last two years. You most likely, as much as we would bash Bud, you probably should have never moved on from him because he did give you the best shot to win from an X's and O's perspective. But from a roster standpoint, this is a bad roster. The other thing is there's no real ways to improve it. You don't really have tradable assets. Teams aren't banging down your door for Brooke Lopez. They're not banging down your door for Chris Middleton. They're certainly not banging down your door for Dame Lillard, who you owe 40 and 50 million to over the next two seasons. So you're kind of stuck. If I'm Giannis, See, I look around, I say, hey, Wisconsin, I have done everything I can for you over the past 10 years. I've brought you a title. I've brought you a claim. I've brought national games here every other week. I got to go. It's not going to get new better. Arena? This is a team that has whatever new new everything i new cheese it doesn't matter i got to get out of, i got to i got to get out of wisconsin because they have failed him from a roster construction standpoint which is the same thing you'll see happen with joke with with joker within the next year or so in denver you're going to look think, around and you're just going to say no one has upgraded the roster around me i That's think it. you're giving doc a little bit too much leeway here because the roster is old but it's not one in six bad. They it have is. looked. They have looked horrible, bro. Who's the they third look, best player? Who's the third, third scorer? Their third best player is probably Bobby Portis. Guess, yeah, well, yeah, Bobby is. Well, Bobby might be the best, one of the best bigs in the world. <laughs> yeah, shout out, shout out, Bobby, shout out, Bobby Portis, shout out, Bobby Portis, <laughs> all star, Bobby P. Yeah, Bobby, shout out, Bobby Portis. No, man. but in all seriousness. Like, Bobby Portis is one of the best bench players in the NBA. Gary Trent, was, a, I thought, was a, a better pickup than he's looked. Oh, Pat, yeah, I guess they Pat Connaughton. We're talking Pat about Con- Lopez. But one in six? One I'm in six, surprised. Nick? I am not surprised. Doc, Doc doesn't – it's not It's not as – things aren't as smooth and solidified. You know what a big thing for me recently is, Nick, as, like, no matter the sport – to tell us a bad team and is being is a bad team overall and being coached poorly is is everything looks extremely hard. Every phase of the game 
for the Chicago Bears and the Dallas Cowboys looks extremely hard. Have you ever watched the? Did you have you watched the Cowboys the last couple of weeks? Everything yeah, looks impossible. Yeah, bro, everything looks impossible. If you watch the 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 box on a possession to possession, it's like, man, this shit looks so difficult. And thank God that Dame Lillard is firing on all cylinders in some of these spots, or we'd be losing these games by twenty points. Thank so, God, thank God, Dame Lillard is firing and still has you at one and six. Giannis right. is averaging 31, 12, and 6 at 64% shooting. What more can he do? Dame Lillard has played well, to your point. What more can he do? And you are still 1 and 6. And speaking of Budenholzer, have you seen the Phoenix Suns lately? Yes, they're By the playing way, very good basketball. Mike Budenholzer is taking care of business out there Taking care of Phoenix. business out there. No doubt. All right. Even last year, it was like we needed superhero efforts from Giannis to win games, and that's what you got. You're getting superhero efforts from Giannis, and you are one. There's games they're not competitive in, and you have a top three player in the world. Like, think about that. You have a top three player in the world, and you're not competitive. If I'm Giannis, I'm saying 31, 12, and 6, and you know I play defense, and we still can't win ball games. And you're telling me, don't worry, Middleton will be back soon? Middleton? Come on, man. Yes, Giannis needs to ask to get out of there immediately. This situation is one that I am 100% confident will not get any better. And Giannis had his hand in some of these changes as well. So he's not off the hook. But that's not how this works. Giannis is allowed to to, to make mistakes. His job is to play basketball. Also allowed to ask to get out of town when shit's not going really well. Get that's me out of here, clout. man. It's been great. You should that's come the, to Chicago. That's the clout. That's the leverage that Giannis Antetokounmpo has. Stay Zach, tuned. Zach, Zach Levine and Zach Levine, Io and Kobe and some ones for Giannis. I mean, of, I, of course, you sign it. You yeah. sign it immediately. Yeah. They would never, they <laughs> if that's would, on they the table. Never. But yeah, that's, uh, that's where should he go? Stretch. Like just out of, out of where? Where should he go? Boston, New York. I know where you want him to go. You want him, you want him. <laughs> Watch Boston makes that deal. Boston? Yeah. Boston pulls insane. a coup. Yeah. Porzingis, some ones, and uh, Sam Hauser for Giannis. <laughs> New, York, New York, I mean, where does he go? I, I don't think you can trade him in the Eastern Conference. Phoenix, LA? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things in, in, that will the come into play with where he goes. Because he's only going to go where he wants to go, right? Yeah. He has to pull the first lever and really actually be trying to get out of town. I'm so ready to go. James. You guys got to get me the fuck out of here. Exactly. Stay. He needs to He needs to call up James Harden and get the game plan in order on how <laughs> how I got to get out of town. So that's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with Giannis and how, Eat and go how that goes. Uh, quickly, because we're running out of time here, let's talk about the West and Oklahoma City. Um, they have been absolutely unbelievable. I knew coming in they were going to be versatile. They don't even have Hardenstein on the squad right now, but they have shooters all over. They play nasty defense. Chet runs the floor, rebounds, impacts on the defensive end. Any thoughts on Oklahoma City and SGA and what they've been doing to start the year? Yeah, it's exactly what we thought they'd be looking yeah, like, it's right? One the, it's one of the three best teams in the NBA, which is exactly what we thought. Holmgren was only going to get better. Their younger guys were only going to get better. Uh, shout out. I never get the – is it Diagnol? Da- Diagnol. Mark Dagnall. Mark Dagnall, Mark Dagnall, great coach. That's a that's a real team, real legitimate team. No doubt. There's and nothing I mean, else to say. Yeah. And and Caruso. And the West, the West is open. By the way. Yeah. Well, Wide. When we're t- yeah, it's the the East coming in was allegedly super top heavy. It's still top heavy. The the West one is team, one team at the top in the East, and that's all. That's <laughs> and the West is a little more open because it is a little more competitive throughout. Not, there's not too too much to say about Oklahoma City other than what we laid out. And for the sake of time, if you were the Denver Nuggets, what do you do there? Because it's almost similar to what's going on in Milwaukee, right? They Oklahoma they City go and add allowing 96 points a game in 2024 NBA basketball. I just, we need to like let that sit there for a minute. They are allowing, on average, 96 points per game. Teams wake up out of bed, unless you're the Knicks last night, uh, sport, sc- sc- scoring 110 points. So th- that's over seven games they've allowed 95 points a game. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, I think that's, that's, that's a sorry, perfect way to put it. on Denver, but yeah. No, also, I will say this. I think the, the schedule here for Oklahoma City is going to get a bit tougher because they played the Nuggets on opening night, and we're going to talk about how the Nuggets are struggling. Then they played the Bulls, Hawks, Spurs, Trail Blazers. Clippers and the Magic, not too many big-time offensive teams jumping off that list. 
couple in a in a week here, they go Suns, Mavericks back to back. They play the Pels. They get all three of those games at home. They got the Warriors coming up. That Warriors game might be eighty to eighty. <laughs> how the Warriors, how the Warriors been playing defense too. But Warriors give me some quick great. thoughts. Warriors defense yeah. is unbelievable. They've been locked yeah. in on that end. So give me uh, some quick thoughts on Jokic in that situation. Westbrook was always going to be feast or famine coming into the fold. It's been famine to start the year. He continues to shoot it from the outside of the poor rate. They, uh, they're they thin as well. They're, they're similar yeah, I mean, to the Knicks in a sense where they that, that starting five is solidified. But outside of that, they're thin. KCP yeah, they gone. Off, start off the season pretty tough. They've obviously played well the last uh, better the last few games. But I think that they have the same, not not quite to the level of Milwaukee, but they have a roster issue in the fact that, look, you look at the championship team and you look at the team that you have now, and those are two completely different squads as far as your supporting roles, right? I think Murray has very clearly been struggling. Um, he, he is not the player that he was. He's, he, he looks appears to be on a decline. Um, that's we'll that's actually an interesting was it, he's shooting like thirty. He's shooting like 30%. He hasn't um, looked yeah, very good. He has not looked good at all. Um, I already said that you're asking Christian Brown to play 38 minutes a night, which, look, I really like Brown. I love the fact that he got in Gobert's face the other night after throwing down an absolutely monster dunk right in the guy's face and then told him about it, which was great. Um, Gobert's just like a whipping, a punching bag. Um, but, yeah, man, just not, 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 not a deep enough roster. You don't have a good enough number two. And I think Jokic is covering up a lot of flaws on that team. They need to make a move. Now, unlike Milwaukee, I think that they do have attractive assets that you can trade away. I mean, you can convince teams to take some of these players. You can get creative with draft picks and things like that. But, yeah, I mean. Strother needs more minutes offensively. Shout out Strother. Yeah, yeah Julian uh, Strother needs more minutes offensively. But Yeah, another really yeah. good young player in the They're second thin. year. But they're, they're thin. thin. They're real thin. Teams are starting to learn about depth in the NBA. If you look at the best teams in the NBA, they're all deep. They're deep. They're Cleveland deep. is Cleveland is deep. deep. Yeah. The Brooklyn Nets are playing a lot better. They're four and four. They kind of have a deep squad. The, the team deep. is a little deeper than people realize. They could they could go down, they could go down the bench and play a lot of guys. The there's a couple teams that are extremely top heavy that have been struggling a bit because they purely do not have depth on the squad. And that's going to be a really interesting thing when it comes down to it. The Celtics are deep. The the Cavs are deep. The Thunder are unbelievably deep. Very so deep. it's uh it's it's interesting as we remember, get we were giving here. Pres- remember a few years ago we were giving Presti all that shit about hoarding all those draft picks. Now he did that, hit on the SGA trade, obviously getting Chet, Jalen Williams, those guys have all panned out. But now you have a whole bunch of draft picks to keep adding depth to that roster. Right? We talked about it with Boston. We talked about what Milwaukee doesn't have. Like when you start hitting on those 20 to 30s and you start getting guys that can actually play legitimate minutes in the NBA, like, and these guys are making what, one, $2 million a year. Some of them, if they're second round guys are making even less than that, that changes the entire trajectory of your team. It allows you to pay your guys at the top and still have guys six through 10 that can contribute. And that's what you're not getting from Denver. What you're not getting from Milwaukee and some of these other teams that are struggling is you're really missing that second half of the roster that's going to carry you through the regular season. Well, yeah, it helps. Well, I think if you're, if you're if if you're Denver, you're no longer looking at like, oh, we are the dominant team in the West. That's not the case anymore, which it was the last couple of years. Um, yeah, it helps when Jalen Williams when Jalen Williams is making four point seven. That's that's great. You got guys that's on a like deal. yeah, Caruso is only making nine point eight million dollars. He's yeah, worth way more than that. So, and he hasn't even yeah. played that well for them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kaysen Wallace is only making 5.5. 5. So, like, yeah. They, yeah the, I mean, the, their the drafting roster. has been in- incredible. And he was yeah. hoarding picks for all those years where he's getting five first round picks a year and you're surrounding him and you miss on a couple, whatever. We got a few more that we'll roll in there and see if these guys work out. So, yeah. Um, obviously, yeah, I, I love I love what they've done from a roster construction standpoint. Um, but it's like the opposite in Denver, I think. Quickly to touch on the NFL. Nick, do you want to talk about the Bears? Do you have any thoughts on the Bears? I don't really have any. Yeah, fire your coach. It's clear that he's lost the locker room. Players are going on radio stations, not giving anything even sounding like a ringing endorsement of your head coach. 
I can't believe the team has come out these two games after the bye week, especially after last week. Everybody talked about it. This should have been a situation where you galvanize the troops. Guys come out fired up to play on Sunday. Looked absolutely flat against the Arizona Cardinals. Caleb Williams looked like shit on Sunday, which is not where we should be after we've seen this guy play well. I blame it on the coaching. I understand people are starting to pile on Caleb a little bit, and there's tons of shit that he needs to clean up. But guess who helps you clean that up as a rookie quarterback? Comp coaching, right? We talk about Jane Daniels and how well he's done. I remember there was criticism early on that, oh, Washington's running a college offense for Jaden. And no, 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 no. Guess what? That college offense has those boys six and two and look in prime position to win the NFC East. So I don't give a fuck about what kind of offense they're running. They're running one that's building him in confidence right, and getting him set up to be a legitimate NFL quarterback, whereas the Chicago Bears are doing the absolute opposite. You still cannot protect anybody. You still have this rookie quarterback running for his life, which creates bad habits. Um, I get the defense has played well, whatever. This guy, Flus, has absolutely no idea what he's doing out there. You need to fire the coach. You need to start over. Here we are again. Tell me if you've heard, read this book before. Um, I'll stop, but... That's all I got, man. It's pretty clear what needs to happen here. Um, and, and you're seeing it on a national level that people have started to realize this coach has no idea. Listen, what did he say uh, at halftime? The score is not where we want it to be. <laughs> Come on, he said, man. He said the, the, score. Score, the score is what it is, and we have each other. <laughs> and we have each other. That was your halftime speech that you gave to the boys. And boy, did they come out and play like that was the speech that you gave. And then it is absolutely inexcusable to have Caleb Williams in there with 30 seconds left when you're down 20, dropping back in zero protection and potentially getting hurt. And then at the end of it, they ask you about it. You say, oh, we're trying to work on things. We're trying to work on the two-minute offense. That is not the two-minute offense at all. Unbelievable. He could have gotten hurt. If, if he would have blown out his knee or hurt his ankle or something like that, Eberflus wouldn't even have been able to get on the plane back from Glendale. So the guy has no idea what he's doing. When you start giving answers like that in press conferences, where it's like, yeah, I, I remember who was our boy over there in the Chargers when they asked him the question? Oh and he goes, God, and, he, oh and he goes, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, hey, when you have that much honesty in your answers that I have, just have no idea what the fuck is going on, that's where we are with Eberflus. You got to move on. Anthony, uh, Anthony, shout out Anthony Lynn. He said, "He said I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure." <laughs> not what sure. were you, what know. were you thinking there? I don't yeah, the funny, know, the funny thing about the Eberflus thing is, there's guys that are in over their head in what they're doing, but they're good at faking it, and they get in front of mics and they sound, they say the right things, and they're polished. And it, it buys them more time. They, you might believe kind of what they're it. saying for a minute, even though it's full bullshit. You can kind of sell it for a little bit. This guy clearly doesn't know what's going on, doesn't know how to run the football team. Then he can't sell it. He's just It's just a complete disaster. He's, he's, he's not good on the mic. He says all the wrong things. He's, Nick, he says all the wrong things, and he does all the wrong things on the field. Yeah, pack it up. It's it's. Uh, we don't need to. I, I've said my piece on Matt Eberflus since and, the day he was hired, and then that fake facade bullshit that we've already seen year in and year out with the Bears, where they put together five wins in a row, and everybody's like, "Okay, great, he could stay. He's a good coach." That's it's the same story we've seen multiple, multiple times, and, and we at here at No Catch Up tried to warn you exactly what was going to happen. And it's very clear he has no respect of the team and whatever message they gave after what happened last week did not resonate with the team at all because everybody is essentially turned and saying like, yeah, we, we don't we don't care what you said. Whatever, whatever discipline you tried to dole out in the locker room, the locker room rejected it. Like the locker room rejected your discipline after last week. It is very clear. When you have Stevenson leaving practice after getting disciplined in a situation where he clearly should have been disciplined during like that tells you that no one respects the message that you're out there given. That's very, 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 very clear. No doubt. We can leave that there. I want to talk about the Jason. I want to talk about the Jason Kelsey thing really quick because I was, I was a little disappointed that he had to come out and apologize. He was on Monday night football last night and they made him apologize for I don't know if they made – I shouldn't say they made him apologize. Jason Kelsey apologized. I don't know how they got there. He or, felt compelled to apologize. Or he felt compelled to apologize, it seems. If you haven't seen the video, go watch it. There's a young kid 
no more than 19 years old, chasing down Jason Kelsey as he's trying to walk to the stadium or walk to a stadium. I don't even know where Jason was at. I think it was at the college. I think maybe it was at Ohio State, Penn State. Yeah, it was, had to yeah. be where it was, right? Yeah, yeah, it was at the Penn State game. And he's walking. They shouldn't be allowed to play football, by the way. But I don't even know why. He's the, you said that they should have struck, this, put the whole program down back in the day. We know, don't, thousand, don't derail it. Don't, don't derail it. Down. Yeah, thousand percent put it down. Program should not be allowed to be in existence. I still don't. Don't get me started on Penn State. Should not be allowed to be in existence. But I digress. Go ahead. Jason is being followed by a kid. The kid is saying slurs at him. He's talking about Taylor Swift and his brother. He uses the F word, the F A word, not the F U C K word. He goes through and says a whole bunch of wild stuff. Yeah. And it gets to the point where Jason Kelsey, and he's got a camera in his face. And you know how we feel here at No Catch Up about having cameras in people's faces that you don't know. He's essentially running down Jason Kelsey with a camera in his face and he's talking crazy. Trying to bait him. Yeah. Yeah, Kelsey grabs his phone, turns around and spikes it and shatters the dude's phone and then picks it up and kind of keeps walking with it like he, like he took his phone, basically. Yeah. The kid then continues to follow him, trying to get his phone back, and he bumps into Kelsey. And I thought Kelsey, I thought it was over. I thought Kelsey was going to turn around and it was going to be a straight right jab. Jason actually kept his cool for the most part after he shattered it, gave the guy his phone back, and he walked off. Nick, where are you at on that situation and how Jason handled it? And um, what do you do in that situation? Do you, you, do you just have to have the mental fortitude and the capacity to just keep walking and ignore dude and shrug him off, grown man or not, just because you know the, the stature and the, the situation that you're in? On one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. Like, Jason Kelsey's a better man than myself. If you're chasing me down, and what the kid specifically said was, how do you feel knowing your brother's an F.A. for dating Taylor Swift like you are really running this man down and calling his family member a slur right like you said I'm just at the game trying to enjoy myself I'm, I'm you know doing the whole Jason Kelsey thing taking taking pictures kissing babies whatever and you got some very clearly drunk and let's not call him a kid a man right you're over 18 and you decide to make those decisions you are a grown man just like I'm a grown man I don't know if Kelsey's there with his family if he's there with his wife who's around him whatever this whole culture of thinking it's cool to run up on people with a camera is one thing. To run up on people with a camera saying off the wall shit, clearly trying to instigate, clearly trying to get a reaction out of this man, talk about his brother who we know that he loves and is close to, and and for what, man? Like, w what are we doing here? So I think if Jason Kelsey were to turn around and absolutely smack the shit out of the kid, and let, let's let's be very clear here. Jason Kelsey could destroy this kid's world in one shot if he really wanted to. He wouldn't have been out of line. He does not need to apologize the next day. He does not need to release a statement about it other than saying, this kid's an idiot, and the next man's an idiot, and the next person that runs up on me like this is going to get dealt with. Like, what do we think it's cool to run up on people like? Like, I don't get it, man. Like, never, never have I ever, ever, Seeing somebody that I just want to run up on and say some crazy shit and believe if I do run up on you, and I'm not trying to pretend like I'm hard or anything like that, but if I run up on you, I need to be prepared to finish what I started. And a lot of people running up on folks and are not prepared to finish what they started, right? Like, again, you're trying to get a reaction. You're trying to instigate a situation, not a fight, because you don't want to fight Jason Kelsey, right? But you're trying to instigate a situation, and you think it's cool. And then if he would have hit him, he would have spent the next couple weeks apologizing. Maybe would have lost his seven-figure ESPN deal, right? And people are looking at Kelsey like he's a bad guy and he can't control himself. Like, that shit is ridiculous. He should have turned yeah. around and smacked the shit out of this guy. Because it's unbelievable that you run up on people thinking that it's cool. Like, I just don't know where we are in society that you feel like you can just start running, running up on people thinking it's cool. And he's better. He's happy. Lucky that Jason Kelsey is a is a, a good guy who can practice some restraint. Because nine times out of ten, you're getting the shit smacked out of you. I didn't realize that he had bumped him as well. But, hey, at that point, no holes barred, right? Like, yeah, so, it's... It's ridiculous. 
No, it is it is ridiculous, and I, I think Jason did a really good job of, uh, of keeping his cool. I don't know who's raising these men to act like that out in the street and in public. It's unacceptable. They look it's like embarrassing. Idiots. It like, is embarrassing. And who are you doing it for? Like, what? You got a story, hey, man, I ran up on Jason Kelsey and called his brother the F word. Uh, like, who is that cool to? Like, you're a clown. Yeah, the clout, the clout chasing. Death by clout is what I like to hey, call what did, it. What did but, Kendrick say? Clout chasing, hell of a disease, brother. Like, these yeah. people are out of control. <laughs> yeah, are exactly out of control. Right. Exactly right. And it's but like, what clout things. is that, though? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, 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 what? Who thinks well, you're just trying cool? to get Which a viral one of your moment? buddies is going to give well, you a high five? Well, I mean, we're talking about it right now, right? Like, they're, his yeah. homies and them, they're t- it's on the news. He got Jason Kelsey to apologize to him on Monday Night Football pregame. Yeah, like crazy. That, I guess that's I guess that's the whole point. But this is a perfect example of like if I ever got famous enough, I would like to think I would just walk around without security. And why do people walk around with security? That's that's exactly why. That's that's yeah, a perfect yes. oh, example oh. of why these people walk around with security because I'm not dealing with you, it. You're, I, and I'm not about to go to jail. I'm not so about to get sued. That, yeah, yeah, I'm not about to do any why, of that shit. Yeah, yes, I would so a thousand would, percent. If you ever are wondering why these guys are walking around with two security guards, with especially with their lady and their family with them, it's because of guys like that. So, without naming names, so obviously you spend a lot of time around the Knicks. Are most of these guys securityed up if they're once they once they exit the? I mean, I know the MSG obviously has security on premises, yeah. but are most of these guys moving with some sort of situation? You know the I, or just I in general, really... are most guys are moving with some sort of situation that you see? Honestly, not really. Yeah, see, I but, am. I mean, the famous people that I've been around aren't too secured, securityed up. They're not. They don't have a bunch of people with them. But also, we're typically in environments where there's not like it's a more controlled environment. I'm not. We're not walking through parking lots with college kids. If you watch the video, Jason Kelsey is like. Speed He's walking part of the crowd. through, yeah. yeah, yeah, and He's part of the crowd. And to be honest, he kind of likes that and enjoys that. We've seen Jason Kelsey out at the tailgates and out, yeah, uh, shotgunning beers with the fans and all that stuff. I guess this is the other side to that, right? Like you want to be out with the people hanging around. You might get a, you might get a, a loose, loose trigger, and that's what this kid was. So we'll leave it there. Stop putting cameras in people's faces. We've we've talked about that at nauseam on no catch up as well. I'm gonna leave it there, man. We got a lot more than we could touch on, but we're Marshall, running. Marshawn, we're run- Marshawn Lattimore traded to the uh, Commanders as we've been on the air. By the way, interesting. It, I, thought Mar- I thought you were gonna say I thought you were gonna say Marshawn Lynch would have folded that kid up, and I, I'm Shawn I'm Lynch. I'm happy that Marshawn yeah, Lynch wasn't that wasn't Jason yeah, absolutely Kelsey. Absolutely would have folded that and, kid up, and and Marshawn Lynch would have would have would have wouldn't have apologized. And yeah, so that's the whole. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say Marshawn Lynch would have killed folks, but yeah, uh, we'll leave it there for Big Nick the Click. I'm your host Sean Little. No catch up sports talk via Chicago. Follow us everywhere, you, anywhere you get your podcast. We're on there: Spotify, Apple, iHeart, wherever. Go tell a homie to tell a friend. Pass them the YouTube link. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at No Catch Up Podcast on YouTube. We're around, man. Big Nick the Quick, Sean Little, No Catch Up Sports Talk in Chicago. We'll see y'all next week.